So good morning, everyone, and um, welcome again uh, to this debate, whose title is Obstructions and Barriers, Who Cares? My name is Andrea Pontiroli. I'm a former MSF and former ICRC. Can I... I would like to... Um, well, first of all, I would like to say that we really have, I know everybody says that, but this is truly a, a very, very interesting and high-level panel, so I think we should make the best of it. Um, you have the bios of everyone in your books. I mean, I wouldn't go through the bios, otherwise it would take a long time. Just briefly, on my left, I have Dennis McNamara, who is now working, if I'm correct, to the... Center for Humanitarian Dialogue in Geneva and has a long experience. I mean, only looking at the countries, you work in Iraq, you work in East Timor, Kosovo, former Yugoslavia, and um, Cambodia. Tom, Tom Koenig's on my immediate right. He's the cham chairman of the Committee on Human Rights and Humanitarian Aid in the German Parliament, but also has a very significant experience with the UN in Kosovo, Guatemala, and uh, Afghanistan. To his right, we have Katrin Woolard. She is the Executive Director of the European Peacebuilding Liaison Office since October 2008 in Brussels. Uh, she will tell us a bit what she does exactly, but uh, basically she will bring a, persp a perspective from an umbrella organization of a huge number of NGO things tank and NGOs uh, whose main objective is to influence the EU to be more effective in preventing conflict and building peace. And then you have Yves Dacour, who has already been introduced, who is the general director of the ICRC. What I'd like to do, I would like to give now the floor to the panel uh, for some five minutes. Each of you will have the chance to react to what Yves has been presenting. I mean, you're quite free uh, to say whatever came up to your mind while listening to Eve, I also take five minutes to them. Then we will allow Eve to to answer to our remarks, comments, criticisms, or questions. Then I'm going to ask a couple of questions to each of the panelists, and then we'll open the floor to your question and comments. And uh, housekeeping, I also have a housekeeping note. I will be very strict in limiting the time for that people spend in explaining their points. So I will ask everybody to go straight to the point because, I mean, we only have a bit more, than one, a bit less than an hour and a half, and I think there's many, many issues that we want to discuss. So I'm, I'll ask Katrin to begin, no, 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 so <laughs> I'll ask Dennis <laughs> to start uh, reacting to, to his speech, what came up to your mind while, while listening to him. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. Um, well, a lot, but I do listen to Eve quite a lot also. <laughs> and we talk quite a lot, so I'll, uh, I'll cut it down. Uh, the Humanitarian Dialogue Center, by the way, is a, is a conflict resolution mediation place in Geneva. And when Eve was talking about building trust, I must say we spend a lot of our life from that center, and uh, like others do, talking to the other side sometimes the uh, undescribable other side. And I can tell you in a real life example, which I was encouraged to give you, we are talking to uh, famous terrorist groups at the moment in some conflicts. And in one of them, when you talked about the iPhones, Eve, we actually have to put all our telephones in the refrigerator in the next room before we have the discussion. And if we don't do that, they won't start talking. So Eve's right. They're very nervous, and they're right to be nervous, according to recent accounts uh, by some of our big friends uh, tapping into these uh, devices. And uh, certainly they believe that we can be party to that. But more generally, perhaps two or three quick points. I, I thought unpacking the access question was a very good phrase. Uh, What's at stake? Well, I'm biased because of my background. I'll, I'll tell you what I think is at stake. I think there's a failure of the international system, a global failure to effectively protect the displaced victims of conflict today. A global failure to effectively protect 
the displaced victims of conflict today. Most displaced populations in the main conflict areas don't receive any effective international or national protection. And I think we hear too much about aid delivery and too little about protection. And that is the challenge I would suggest to the, to the system, to us all. And I worked with Jan Eglin for some years trying to help reform the system and, and overcome this hurdle, and we haven't succeeded. And some of those agencies that we decided should be the lead on that protection are not doing it. Some of them are not doing it. Of course there's huge problems. We're in conflict areas with rogue regimes and, and even more roguish uh, opposition groups sometimes. And we're in the conflict areas. Of course it's problematic, but that, we know that. That's not all new. And I think there's a need for a fundamental review, not a tinkering with the edges of the system. It needs a fundamental review. It needs a review, I think Eve touched on as well, with other actors. Humanitarians are a bit nervous about other actors. We don't like politicians and security and military too much. But you've got to talk to them. You've got to get them at the table and talk about these things in a different way. Humanitarians often sit around the table together and agree, and we all nod in unison. It doesn't actually change a lot. So I think there is a need for that. And I would just add, and for May, the other aspect I think is fundamental is, is the nature of conflicts. 99% of conflicts today are internal. There's only one interstate conflict globally today. That means governments fighting their own people. It means sometimes privatization of conflicts or commercialization of conflicts or criminalization of conflicts, a different nature of conflict. And the international system is essentially statist. And the UN, where I work most of my life, is statist. It's created by states. It answers the states to deal with states. It doesn't deal well with non-state actors. And then we have this impossible anti-terrorist legislation imposed by some governments which makes it even criminally liable to deal with some organizations. There are huge problems to deal with the other side, with the non-state actors. And we've got to do it. And we eventually will do it. And we do do it in all conflicts. There's always a dialogue in the end, but there's huge problems placed by states often to deal with the non-state actors. We have to overcome this hang up and we have to have that dialogue. And I think uh, until we get to there, we'll have the Security Council, which by the way is composed of the world's major arms sellers, vetoing peacekeeping operations or employing peacekeeping operations from a state perspective only. There's very little uh, input into those Security Council decisions from the non-state actors. And they are the parties to the conflict, and they are essential to its resolution. Thank you. What I think is necessary to see that the conflicts have changed, uh, and that requires a different attitude towards conflicts. Uh, when I was uh, told to go to Guatemala uh, to oversee a peace accord, uh, I was asked by Kofi Annan, uh, Tom, I know you as a very principled person. Are you prepared to shake hands with, with blood on it? Uh, I certainly said, yes, sir. I didn't know what I answered. <laughs> but it is necessary to speak with everybody. And the notion we have in these countries and these parliaments, and I realize that, is to declare others as terrorists. We see it from Assad, but even here we have it with the sanctions list, to declare people as terrorists and all of a sudden you have to talk to them. In Afghanistan I had to talk to governments who are on the sanction list. And the Security Council visitors didn't say, they said, well, we will not talk to them. The Russian delegate said, I will not be present. So he went to the restaurant and we had to talk to this person. We have to talk to everybody. Otherwise, access is not possible. That's my, my first remark. And declare parties as terrorists might be true in a scientific sense, but it doesn't help. The opposite does help, to be prepared to speak with the devil. John Egerland in a given moment said, if I have to t talk with the devil, I will do so about the condition in hell where we all will end, which I thought is reasonable. But we have in the capitals here not the adequate debate on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
not only that we don't discuss access altogether, there was a time when it was discussed. In the Balkan Wars, it was discussed. We saw on the TV all these trucks which were stopped in front of Sarajevo. This was discussed. We, haven't, we don't have a practical debate. So what I ask you as members of organizations, restart this debate, including the debate on the principles, because they are not so present anymore and they are at stake, for instance, in Afghanistan, but also in Syria. And not only to speak about access, but about direct access, I think is very reasonable. To have the people being seen, being visited, even by international, and access is not only to the sick and to the wounded, but also to the prisoners. Access to prisoners in Syria is a real point, but also access to prisoners in Afghanistan is or in Guantanamo, as you all know. Uh, the last one, which, on a positive note, the debate on protection of civilians in the conflicts we have, in armed conflicts, protection of civilians, is a very lively debate, a debate which is held in the United Nations, in the NGOs, in the public. To feed into this debate, I think, is positive, and that we have this debate is really necessary. It wasn't so some time ago. I think it's also necessary to speak about civilian casualties in activities of uh, military drones and so on. It does make a difference, but only if we speak about the civilian casualties on all sides. And what I see uh, in the development in Afghanistan uh, that having counted having the civilian casualties did matter. Even towards the Taliban, even the Taliban apparently don't uh, sacrifice that easily um, civilians. That is important. Altogether, the debate on humanitarian uh, access in the public, in the centrals, in the universities, in the parliament, is important and there's a lot, a lot to be expected and a lot to be improved. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I already managed to create four pages of notes, but I perhaps won't share them all now. Um, I thought a very interesting keynote presentation, and like the other respondents, I also agree with this approach of trying to unpack access because it is something extremely complex, but it's also something that should be understood to be context-specific in order to understand obstacles to access, but also to develop effective strategies to deal with access problems. It clearly needs to be understood. However, I think the same probably also applies to the humanitarian principles. And talking about humanitarian principles at threat is also an idea that I think needs more unpacking. Where are they at threat and how and how to tackle that? In relation to that, I wanted to pull out one of the key aspects of the keynote presentation. And this is the question of the changing nature of conflict, but I think also of responses to conflict. As other respondents have mentioned, conflicts are increasingly intrastate, but this is not new. This has been happening since the 1960s. And, and they increasingly involve non-state armed groups. But I think what we're seeing recently, which is having a, an extremely detrimental effect on humanitarian actors, is the new generation of non-state armed groups that are increasingly well-informed and assertive and start to use humanitarian actors as uh, pawns, in a sense, in other political games. When looking at non-state armed groups, again, I think it's worth trying to understand the different types of groups involved there. And a key distinction I would make is between those that are de facto authorities controlling territory. So, for instance, the Al-Shabaab case in certain parts of Somalia, the OPT situation, and those that are insurgent groups uh, fighting against governmental authorities. But many other distinctions can also be made. Um, I think the implications there for IHL dealing with non-state armed groups remains a challenge. If we look at non-international armed conflict, armed groups in a sense have duties but not rights. And these kind of things remain, I think, a sort of frontier area of IHL. 
And humanitarians, as was mentioned by Eve, are increasingly entangled in conflicts. And that leads to the challenges to the principles that are mentioned. I think in particular we see a disconnect between neutrality, being neutral, and perceptions of neutrality. And that perhaps we can explore more in the discussion. And um, finally, as I said, it's not just about the changing nature of conflict, it's about changing responses to conflict, uh, which is part of the political landscape. I think the continued dead weight of counter-terrorism is severely affecting humanitarian activities. And I say counter-terrorism not just as a set of activities, legal standards, policies, but also in a sense as a world view and one that places different values on different lives, as has already been mentioned, that excuses the killing of some but not of others. Um, for from a practical point of view for humanitarians, uh, I think it skews delivery of humanitarian assistance, as we see very clearly in Palestine, for instance. So that's affecting non-discrimination as a principle. Um, it's preventing, if leading to funding cuts, legal obstacles, etc. Uh, the final point, that I wanted, I thought was interesting from the presentation, and then I will just wrap up with a few suggestions on responses where I'd like to hear the audience's view as well. This call for direct access, and the point you made at the end about the difficulty of outsourcing, or some of the negative effects of outsourcing to local partners and others, this goes against what's developed as a standard organizational model for many international NGOs. I think it's something that's been imported from the development sector based on principles as well, the principle of building local capacity, empowering local actors in order to withdraw. So to see it now challenged, I think, is something um, that will, would also be very interesting to debate. Uh, finally, this is finally, I can see the chair trying to rein <laughs> me in. Um, <laughs> how, how should humanitarians uh, be responding to this changing political landscape and the access obstacles to access that it throws up? Um, one, I think there has to be a deep rethinking of how to apply the principle of neutrality within this landscape mm -hmm. and working in a context where there's this uh, division between the, the West versus the rest, uh, the product of counter-terrorism responses, uh, neutrality has to be reviewed. Improved in engagement with armed groups is clear, but understanding distinctions between criminally motivated, politically motivated armed groups, how to engage with the two. And um, counter-terrorism legal laws and policies in many cases don't prevent contract, uh, contact with armed groups, yet humanitarians often believe that that's the case. Um, so I think there's no reason not to be engaging. Uh, but I think perhaps there's also a question of, for humanitarians in rethinking who they are. They are perceived as Western players. Uh, this question we've been asked, if you had to found a humanitarian organization today in order to overcome access problems, would you base it in a Western country? Would you, in order to ensure the principle of neutrality, where would you base it? How would you staff it? What neutrality means is different within this particular conflict environment. Um, I think the question of protection is a very, it poses many difficult dilemmas because protection and also increasing use of human rights based approaches is something that leads to perceptions that humanitarian actors are not neutral. And when I say protection, the increased emphasis on protection as a way to persuade governments to act. Um, and then finally, personally, I think there could be stronger advocacy against counter-terrorism by the humanitarian sector using its weight. Mm. And this is something we work on in peace building and we would certainly, could certainly work in closer alliance. I see suggestions that humanitarians should try to reconcile with counter-terrorism objectives in some cases, notably the new report out mm. from New Norwegian Refugee Council on Ocha. Mm. This I find highly problematic. Um, and then really finally, I think there's um, much more that can be done to look at the questions of prevention. And this wasn't really touched upon, uh, but underlying all issues. And I think it also in terms of being perceived as neutral and being effective, 
uh, looking, moving away from response to prevention. Thank you. I take the floor for one minute to allow Eve <laughs> to think about, but um, okay, there were many, many points, and I mean, the debate will continue, so what I would like just to uh, add a few points so that Eve has even more, uh, uh, but I mean, we, we, we'll, we will give you 10 minutes to, to respond to all of this, don't worry. <laughs> but I mean, of all the, the points that were raised by, by the panel, I think I would really, I'd be really interested in hearing your views, first of all, on this should we unpack humanitarian principles? I find that quite an interesting um, question. Uh, also, the, the question of shaking hands with the devil or that was raised by, by a number of people. And how does it, and what's the link with, with this all counter-terrorism? I mean, this is a, a, another interesting point in that, you know, the whole contact that you have by shaking hands. Um, I also would like you to react, Eve, uh, being the ICSC, the Guardian of IHL, on the questions about non-state armed non arm groups having duties and not rights, which I think is very interesting also for the audience to, to gain a bit of an understanding, uh, understanding on this. I will also ask, ask you to answer to the more existential question, who are we as humanitarians? Um, from your speech, I mean, most of the interesting point, of course, had already been mentioned by the panel, so I, would, I, I was left with the trip advisor effect, which, uh, trip advisor effect, which I still think is very interesting, but I guess that, um, in a way, it leads to the question, who is reporting about uh, humanitarian access? And, um, but also to the question, there are two fundamental questions. One is, why should the rest of the world care? especially today, uh, I mean, we are in Europe and, and we all are aware of, you know, where the interests of the people are today. The, 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 there's no more space, even in international summit, I mean, unless it's uh, an iPhone which is um, been hacked, otherwise we all talk about what happens inside our, uh, our own borders and we're interested in Syria, especially from a European perspective, I think only so far as we might have more people trying to cross the sea and, and come into a... So it's, it's, it's a very... Has it really changed? I mean, the, is, there, is there an interest? Is there a real interest um, out there? And also, I think in a way, this, this idea that we're trying to, to put the question of access to the forefront of, of international media, I mean, to the forefront of the, inter of the debate, which is already very difficult, but at the same time, um, do we need media attention? Do we need a discussion about it? Which seems to be one, one of the things I infer from your speech. Or do we need silence? I mean, how helping or how helpful or unhelpful is media attention when you're trying, we're trying to access Syria today? So is it better, I mean, silence kills, we always said, especially in MSF, but what about noise, too much noise, too much attention? Isn't it also difficult? So, to you, Eve. It's really great. I didn't know that I had the chance to do a second round of, uh, of discussion. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be, to be brief because there is a lot of things which were said which would need much more um, serious thinking. But just quickly, I, w I see four or five, let's say, cluster of, of questions. Can we start maybe with us, us here as a group? Um, and then I would enlarge it. I think one of the big problems for me is, and I I'm really saying that, is we pretend to be a community. And it's a major problem. I'm sorry about that. It's time for us to agree that we are not a community. I know it's a shock. I'm sorry, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but we are definitely not a community. And I'm not saying negatively against that. But we are competitive. I've never seen, I've worked in other sectors. I mean, humanitarian sectors, sorry to say that, is a rather competitive sector, right? In terms of funds, in terms of positioning, right? We are very diverse. Incredible. We have organization with double mandate, you know, humanitarian and development. 
as an example, which is totally different from organizations who are very specifically humanitarian. We have organizations which are membership organizations, other not at all. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it will be time for us also to start to agree that the way we speak and the way we you know, try to portray ourselves as a collective is so far from what the people are experiencing that we start to have a problems. We need to be very careful. I think so. Maybe you're not the right crowd because MSF is very much aware, and Médecins du Monde also, and, but I think we need to, to, to grasp that, right? And I think it's a bit of an issue. What should the community say, whatever? Yeah, fine, but I'm not sure about that. I think what I would find much more interesting is that we focus on few issues collectively and see what we can do. Instead, for example, if I take one example about the humanitarian principle, everybody today pretends to be neutral, impartial, you know, that's the mantra. Everybody, you cannot be humanitarian if you don't do that. But then you can still say that in a table, at the same time agree to, uh, in fact, work uh, in Afghanistan on one side only, not the other, and be completely under control by government. I mean, just that's, I found difficult to link it. I'm not saying we don't have a dilemma, but I think there is issues that we need to be a little bit more open about that. And that relates me to the question of Catherine about how do we do neutrality in all the questions. Yes, we need to impact. But I think we have to agree that a lot of humanitarians should be absolutely clear that they are not neutral. Yeah. And they should be relaxed about it. You don't have to be neutral. You know, I don't know why. I mean, just, and maybe more specific, I am of the opinion that humanitarian professional organization, principal organization, should first and foremost focus on humanity and impartiality. Mm -hmm. Whatever is your mandate, whatever you take, impartiality should absolutely be, for me, a no-go if, if you're not. If you're not impartial, really, we should challenge it enormously and be much more open about that. Because this is really the base if we want to be serious, again, with people affected, wherever. Neutral, independent, we can discuss about that. Right? Uh, and I, I find, so th there is a bit of an issue about how do we project ourselves. And by the way, I'm in, in all this coordination meeting and all the places which are important, but we have this discourse which I think we allow then also politicians, parliament, media also to use, to use that. And we found it difficult to be more specific. So what I would say is I have, I have slightly a bit of a problem if we continue to speak with language. So we have to work in our language. So we are not talking about humanitarian community. We're not talking about a system. A system means there is a center, rules, control, nothing like that. It's a good news, by the way. Uh, we're not talking about a sector, neither an industry. I think we're talking about landscape. We can discuss, not, it's not very positive. I'm happy to take any new concept, uh, but just let's challenge the things we are using, which I think is absolutely not, not helpful. Let's put it that way. And this is a collective. Uh, maybe the Congress will solve that. Uh, if, you can, if there is anything, I would be interested to, to know how you, you find that. My second point is, is linked with, uh, uh, with all the questions about um, uh, engaging. And it was Dennis who says that. I totally agree with what Denise says. And I think what seems for me one of the critical factors is it's time for us, I see, I see that's already the case, but we can certainly do better, but other actors also, is really to be able to engage you know, all the, the, the key stakeholders, and including, and that's important for me, military, defense. I mean, they are critical to the world of tomorrow, they will shape it. This is the one where it's happening. And I'm still amazed to see how many humanitarian, in a way, sometimes are nervous about just engaging. I'm not talking the field here, I'm talking politically. You know, just engaging defense for anyone. Critical. It is fundamental that there is a real engagement. There are some improvements, but I think we could do much better. Counterterrorism, we are very late, you know, in this discussion. I'm not sure we will make it, to be honest. And I'm not sure, again, as a collective, we'll be able to look into that, right? We have let, you know, country like, uh, like UK, for example, if I take an example, not only Germany. I mean, that's not just a problem of counterterrorism. There is legislation, national legislation, over the last 10 years, which have changed absolutely the landscape in UK, as an example, right? What happened? Where were you? Where were us, you know, you know to be able to engage that? I think that's really a question we should ask ourselves, and it's time, I agree with you, to, to look into that and be more specific on our ability to engage, and not just advocate. I'm not saying advocate. It's exactly what you said, Catherine, in terms of prevention, almost. I would say, let's work with them, trying to understand where they're coming from, what are the issues, what type of legislation will be drawn in, 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 in Europe, but also in the world. I mean, how do we work around that? I think that seems for me something very important. 
Um, coming, coming back to, um, I'm, I'm trying to move on. So there is one cluster, which is us community. Let's move on that. There is a second cluster uh, to engage all actors. Still us, I think we need to do that. Then I would like to, to move outside and to talk about the, the, some of the uh, arm group we mentioned. I'll, 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 don't, don't worry, I'll, I won't be that long. Um, my sense is there is different, there, this, we can discuss a lot about the responsibility, role responsibility for arm group. We would have a tendency, and I know customary law is not perfect, but if you look customary law, customary law spell out clearly the responsibility of arm group. Yes, under customary law, absolutely, arm group have a responsibility to, in fact, obey. Uh, uh, by certain rules, very clearly. I mean, just absolutely. they're not free to do everything they do. And we have, uh, we had serious discussions uh, with Taliban, for example, on, on, on their responsibility. Now, of course, the problem we do have, let's be clear, it's more difficult for us humanitarian to have sometimes difficult long-term discussions with armed groups like the Taliban than with government where you can sit and maybe have a more classical discussions over time. I'm not saying, saying with governance easier, but it's maybe the ability to influence is, is different. But we have a responsibility, we do too, not only to discuss access with armed group, but to be able also to discuss protection, to discuss uh, respect of international mental law, absolutely, absolutely. And again, for me, my point is being then being able to have direct access, understanding what's happening is absolutely central. So yes, they do have a responsibility, and let's be very careful that we don't buy into this old idea that states are the one who have responsibility, on group have not. Sorry, that's painful, right? They do have a responsibility, even if sometimes their behavior is absolutely not acceptable, but they do have responsibility, and we need to make sure that we work uh, with the necessary tool. If IHL doesn't apply, there's always human rights which applies. There are national legislations which absolutely allows you to be able to, have a, to start a discussion. I totally agree, uh, Tom, if I may call you Tom, uh, I totally agree with, uh, uh, with what you, you said about uh, counter-terrorism and the way also to, to, in fact, put on people the notion uh, and the label of terrorist. Here I can see the impact it has, because of course when you start to say that, and, I'm not, and I do understand that they are terrorist list, I do, I do see that, but it's true, the tendency to say when you are labeled terrorist, nobody can anymore engage you, nobody can speak to you, nobody can even reach you, I think it's really to, the minimum to say that's not a recipe to help to engage, to connect, to find, to discuss with this group. And I found that extraordinarily problematic that uh, organizations like the United Nations receive instructions in Afghanistan not to talk to the Taliban for years or to Hamas for years. What do you think it, what is the result of, of that kind of things? I mean, when you discover the Taliban 10 years after the beginning of the war, I mean, don't expect them to be cool and nice with you. I mean, just, that won't happen, you know? No, really, I mean, don't expect them to you declare I'm neutral. I mean, just, you're joking. So that's a real issue. And again, my problem is bringing all that together making, make, makes, makes a huge worry, right? When we see the UN going now for a more and more integrated mission, it seems for me that it seems for me that at least some people in New York have not grasped the lessons from what happened in Afghanistan. Right? It seems for me, and you will again put some of our UN colleagues, especially the one working on the humanitarian side, under an enormous pressure. How do you think Al Shabaab, to take another example in Somalia, would even look at the UN? I'm not saying Al Shabaab are nice people, not at all, but I'm saying if we want to be able to engage these people, we need to be perceived and to demonstrate impartiality and possibly neutrality. So I found difficult, and I agree with you, this push now to labelize and the tendency to say this is the people which are, you know, the kind of a black and white system makes me nervous. It doesn't help us at all. I do understand it maybe helps government, but it doesn't help us at all. Last but not least, I just wanted to take Andrea questions on top advisors and people care with. I have a slightly different perspective, Andrea, than you do. And here I'm ready to be challenged. I have the impression that people, surprisingly enough, are more interested, or not, let's say, they're not less interested, let's put it differently, uh, by the humanitarian problems in the world. Uh, I'm dealing a lot with China in my job. I'm impressed to see how much public opinion in China is interested in debating Syria. Incredible. Much more than a few years ago. So, to take just the example of China. So, I don't have the impression, you know, that they are not interested at all what's happening in the world. I don't think so, I don't think so. What is the issue, and here we have a bit of a problem, is maybe they feel also 
that um, what it says about Syria, that all of us, in a way, the way we say it, and including, by the way, the government, all that, that there is no solution, that in fact nothing is changing, that is a risk in terms of how much people are perceiving us relevant or not. I see much more. So I don't see an interest going down. I see much more challenge about our relevance. And that, I think, is a bit of a question. And then, of course, linked with what you said, and then we have to talk about that, we are living in an environment here in Germany, but also around Europe and in the world, which is much more tough in terms of economic environment. People will challenge more and more the money, the, the, aid, the money spent in humanitarian aid. I have no doubt on that one. Right? That's clear. They will link it with what happened to them. Why are we spending so much money in Congo and we had to cut the health services in, uh, in London? I mean, people will find that difficult more and more. And so far, it seems for me that uh, government, but also some of us, we didn't find the right answer. We are trying to give more reporting, more data to show that we have impact. And I don't think that's the right, the right approach. I think we will have to rethink a little bit, and it links me to access. I would find interesting that we also talk to the public, including government, including, for example, the, Ger the, the German Minister of Foreign Affairs, if I take this example, says much more openly that you support, they support organizations who have a direct access to the toughest place. That would be interesting, right? They would have in the indicators the ability to distinguish between organizations who have access through partner, which is okay, or organizations who have access directly. And again, link it to finish with that, Catherine. For me, it's not wrong that people and organizations have now moved into having much more access or working more with outsourcing. It's okay for me. It's, uh, frankly, it's an okay model. But then we have to agree about the limit, as always. It cannot just be a model that you apply everywhere in every situation. Frankly, I think the UN does a great job with their partner in some places. But in conflict, what we've discovered, again, and it's sad, in Syria, in Mali, in Afghanistan, in Libya, just to take the last example, just having organization works only through partner doesn't work. And that needs to be understood. Thank you. Thank you. So now I'm going to ask three questions, not to all of you, because otherwise we'd eat all the time. So I selected randomly whom I will ask the questions to. The panelists don't know what question I'm going to ask them, so <laughs> bear with them. So my first question is to Dennis and Tom. In light of your, can I say, long and significant experience, I mean, the first question is, why? I mean, we're talking about barriers. So why people put barriers, and we're talking barriers to humanitarian system, we're not talking barriers about everything, but why this barrier exists? Why people put barriers against MSF, the CRC, and other humanitarian organizations whose only objective is to provide life-saving humanitarian assistance without mangling? Exactly, why? And also, in answering this, to what extent are we talking about a new phenomenon? Because sometimes you always have the feeling that we are rediscovering things that we're talking about this time past in which things were better, but as he was telling us, I mean, today there's more money than ever, and there are more humanitarians than ever, and yet, all we talk about in all these conferences is so difficult. So why these barriers exist, and to what extent, in your opinion, in your personal experience, also, is this a new phenomenon? You want to go first? Who wants to go first? First of all, uh, what has been described as a new phenomenon uh, was uh, that humanitarian action and actors are seen by the uh, uh, conflict partners uh, as partners, uh, as actors in the conflict, as instruments for fighting the war or uh, for uh, supporting one or the other party and so on. This has always been the case, but as long as uh, conflicts are somehow organized that one state is fighting the other, it's easy to decipher. Now, where you have a hundred or thousand different actors uh, and a landscape which is completely uh, uh, chaotic, it shows up uh, much more that you have uh, not only two or one checkpoint, uh, but uh, 18 uh, to reach out to the people. So it, uh, I wouldn't say it's a new phenomenon, but it's more uh, through the, uh, the type of conflict, it's more visible. 
uh, and uh, we have to deal with it. I take the opportunity to make two other remarks mm, on uh, what has been, has been said. Uh, first is an observation I made in Afghanistan. I worked there in 2006. The only people who had access to the Taliban were the ICRC. And not because they are nice and in Switzerland, but because the representative had visited all the Taliban in jail five, 10, or even 15 years before. He knew them all. This is an asset, access for over a long time and knowing the partners and having seen them in jail helps. The second, I wanted to, the second I wanted to say is a remark you made. Uh, you ask, is there a real interest in humanitarian action, in humanitarian aid? Yes, there is an extreme interest. And there are so many people, the question now, how do we, uh, do we get to work in your organizations? Uh, so many people ask me, how could we help? Where could we engage? Uh, how could we, uh, could we uh, bring our knowledge uh, into the humanitarian aid. It is very popular and that's very good. What is not so popular and not so well known is the professionality. What professionality is needed? What should a student do uh, to be a, uh, an important member uh, in an action in Central Africa? Um, yeah, why? Why barriers? Well, I, Eve will forgive me this. You know, humanitarian action and activities are fundamentally at core political, essentially political. They're politically hugely important. Yes, the separation, but that's the reality. Look at, look at the Syria debate for six months or more before the chemical weapons. It was mainly about access, humanitarian access. Why? Because there was no political access. So there's the humanitarian substitute. The R2P, the POC bombing of Benghazi was a politically endorsed act by the Security Council to so-called protect civilians. Actually, it wasn't about that so much. It was about overthrowing the regime. So, you know, that's a reality. I think we're not naive about that. It doesn't mean we should politicize our humanitarian response, but we should be, if I can, uh, perhaps I shouldn't quote the Secretary General, but perhaps I will, who said once, the most famous uh, Secretary General, Hammarskjöld, we should be politically celibate, but not necessarily virginal. That usually gets a stunned silence, but it's got some reality, I would suggest, in, in, in the UN state uh, context. So I think that's one fundamental reality. I don't think it's new. I would suggest that it's more intense today. I've counted 10 serious conflict areas globally today where we don't have any effective international access. Starting from Kachin in northern Myanmar, through to Baluchistan, through to South Kordovan Blue Nile, to South Central Somalia and Syria and others in between. I would suggest, but please correct me, I think that's the most no-go areas internationally that I've seen in decades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think Sri Lanka and other situations have proved that it you can get away with it. Kick the UN, say, tell the West to buzz off, have a couple of good friends who will help you in the Security Council and do what you like with the civilians. And that's what they've been doing. And we've got, just to finish it, millions of civilians in conflict zones today who are highly vulnerable and abused on a regular basis. And we're not there, and as Eve says, you can't do protection by remote, that's for sure. And I would even say you have, to, you have to have internationals if you want to try and protect, I'm sorry. It's not nationals who can do it in those conflict areas. And we're not there. And I think, I think the message is that if you take a hard line as a, as, a, as a regime or as a rebel group, you can get away with it. And you can abuse and misuse the populations with some impunity. That's why my thesis is we have to look at a radical reform. I don't think it's working. Thank you. Uh, now, Katrin and Eve, the question for you is who? And I know we mentioned states and armed groups. I mean, we, we, I think we name Al Shabaab and the Taliban, I think, 20 times during this panel. And the idea also the states are, as Eve said, that you know, states is, is, uh, are becoming stronger in a way, although. 
Uh, but I'm also interested, if you could elaborate a bit on to what extent other actors are putting more or less direct barriers. I mean, I'm thinking about business, and this could be, you know, the mine companies in Congo or uh, the clothing company in um, in some other countries where you have other kind of barriers to access. I'm thinking about Bangladesh just very recently and, uh, and the collapsing of, of the building of textile industry where apparently there was some blockage uh, on, on the involving uh, international actors, not because there was a conflict, but because it was bad for business. So to what extent are we seeing new or not so new uh, actors in addition to state armed groups which are putting up barriers when you might have trying to intervene? I, I'll just refer to one example that I think is uh, quite an interesting one, which is related to banking and the financial system. And so not necessarily looking at physical barriers in country, but the, again, it takes us back to counterterrorism and the increased monitoring of financial transactions and the heavy impact, uh, I think particularly on Islamic charities of uh, of uh, trying to access the funds that they need for operations. And again, I think this is an area where perhaps more advocacy but also legal challenges could be quite useful. And again, referring to the report on the impact of counterterrorism that has just come out, commissioned by Norwegian Refugee Council, is quite interesting. The What we're seeing is an overly cautious approach by a number of financial institutions so even if there's no solid grounds or no, certainly no evidence that an organization has any contact uh, with, terror, with prescribed uh, listed organizations, they may still suffer uh, as a result of this. And I, again, I would say this is something that would be interesting to hear if there are people in the audience who've been directly affected in that sense. So we have a set of private actors. And the other private sector area, of course, is the increasing uh, prevalence uh, use of private sector companies. Um, and certainly a number of areas uh, are traditionally under the laws of war are not necessarily being applied and respected by private sector companies. And I think also we see the questions of accountability are very different when we're looking at their operations compared to government or international missions. Um, I think it would be useful to, to look, if, if you talk about private sector like that, it, it, I think it's always difficult to be in a vacuum. I would look at them as our aim is really to uh, act and to influence. And we all have to agree that we are in a world where access is not imposed, but is negotiated. That's it. Our job is to negotiate access without, of course, losing what we want to do, very principled approach. So in that sense, if you think about that, of course, there are areas where private actors are critical, not everywhere, but they are critical. They are essential uh, to also influence uh, key government, but also uh, some of them, as you know, private sectors of control, sometimes militias, armed groups. So they are absolutely central in the way we have to connect that. Uh, yes, and we have to think that, but we have to think a bit more largely, right, in terms of what we want to, to achieve. And talking about new actors, I don't know if we can frame them under new actors, but some of you mentioned that quickly before. I just would like to come back on that, which is, in fact, all the Turkeys and the Qatar of the world. We didn't speak so much about that. And I, it's, it's, it's also a question, it's a reflection. I'm not sure I, I got it right, but we should look very carefully what is happening right now in Somalia. Why Somalia? Because what is interesting in Somalia, Somalia over the last two years... There was a country like Turkey who really decided to politically but also economically invest in Somalia. Politically, what, politically they take a quite a big risk. You saw that his, the prime minister and his family and his family went to Mogadishu. Um, and it was an interesting message because we have a lot of politicians from the Western world who went to Mogadishu but with heavy armed guard and alone or with their tap. And he went with his family, which I thought was interesting as a message. But here, what is also the message is, what is interesting message is, we, me as a, as a very important person, uh, me as a country, a Muslim country, I'm here to talk to Muslim uh, communities, and I will bring this Muslim perspective. 
Uh, and I think it's interesting to look at uh, now 18 months uh, later. What is happening if you go in Mogadishu, it's true, if you look at through a Somali eyes, you know, a citizen, normal, somebody in the street, it's true, Mogadishu is changing a little bit, and the few investments which are visible are Turkish investments. That's clear. Absolutely clear. Facts. Right? You're very impressive. At the same time, if you take facts, the last three months, there was a series of very visible attacks against Turkish interests by Al-Shabaab. So not only the UN, but also attack. And what's interesting as a message here, and we'll see how it works, what's interesting is not because you're coming from one country, which is maybe a Muslim country, and helping people, that everybody will enjoy and appreciate who you are. It's not because you are that, that you're more impartial or more relevant. It's interesting. It means that, again, in this combination, what we see, whatever your origin is, whatever you take is, you will still be measured by the armed group. Are you supporting the government or not? If you support the government, then you are my enemy. It's interesting to look into that. And I'm just saying that because we've seen Turkey and a, and a very sophisticated and interesting machine, right, and government being involved in that. It will be interesting to see how it will impact their own wording about humanitarian aid and, and the type of thing. I'm saying that, and I think they are welcome in the humanitarian world, but it will be interesting to see does that impact them in the way they look, in the way they also influence the debate then at the Security Council or in the General Assembly, whatever. I would, I would find very important, I would follow that very closely because there is a trend right now to have a fourth government which will push more their own actors, their, uh, you know, through in a way a lens of religious or uh, cultural difference and they will challenge much more in a way what I would call universal value. And we'll have to look carefully of how does that uh, underpin. Last but not last, j just in terms of no go area, it, it's true. I mean, there are pockets of almost absolute absence of international humanitarian actors. I'll be careful. Some of the civilians still got help. Let's be careful. Uh, then it's not by us, but by local. I mean, uh, remarkable. There is still work in Baluchistan, for example, which is the, one of the most difficult places. I mean, there is still some Baluch local organization who are doing things, and they're doing a great job. What is difficult is just in order not to that we say there's nothing. And, uh, but what is true is then the protection part of it, again, back to that, is a very, very much under pressure. And in history, I have a slightly different perspective, Dennis. Yes, there was a time where there was even worse. Watch us the time of, I'm sorry to say that, uh, if you look at the Soviet Union at the time, uh, I mean, there was a lot of space which, frankly, were absolutely out of reach for international humanitarian organization. It's a long time, but we were totally out of the game. By the way, UN, Red Cross, whatever, there was very of us being able to really work uh, under a large part of the world. Today we are. It's very complicated. It's very challenging. Uh, and I think we, we need to, uh, to, to agree with that. Last but not least, can I just take a, a comment of Tom about professionalization? Um, I think it's, a, it's, for me, one of the big issues, and, and I think it's extremely important that we recognize over time that uh, humanitarian action activities have become much more professional. There is a need for professionalism. We bring a lot of different expertise from very sophisticated med medical expertise to diplomatic expertise, water engineer, uh, whatever. I mean, it's amazing if you look at the level of, of expertise we have in our organization, and it's so different today, right? Uh, but then two issues for us. One, we need to make sure that we do not professionalize too much, as we've seen in the health sector, for example, that we sometimes when you professionalize too much, you have a trend and then you, be, you start to be totally compartmentalized. You know, you have experts who speak to experts. Or we need to be able to still keep an eye of what the population is doing. Because more, we expert, more you have experts, more we professionalize. The quality is remarkable, but there is a real risk that people, the experts, will look at the need of the people through the expertise. Water engineer, they will ask to the people, what is your problem of water? But if there is no problem of water, uh, they will still fix a problem of water, right? Because that's what they've learned, and, that, and it's great. But it means for us as a challenge, we need to be able to, to really make sure that we have also professional of, uh, generalist professional, if you want, like doctors. We have the same issues in, in what we've seen with doctors. And my second is big issue we have, we as a group, is people outside this room, people in the street, 
don't perceive that humanitarian world is a, is, is a profession at all. They don't, really. They still think, and maybe we have also said that, it's, that's mainly first and foremost voluntary, people giving you know, their help and whatever. And I can see in the media how quick and how tough are debates about salary of humanitarian worker, right? And sometimes rightly so, but we will have an issue in terms of reputation still if we're not able to say yes, we are professional, uh, it requires a lot of responsibility. Today, being a, a head of a mission or head of a delegation in a country like Yemen, for example, or Congo, or other places for the Red Cross, or for MSF, or Médecins du Monde, is an extremely heavy duty in terms of responsibility. Barely comparable with anything you see in the private, really. And it needs to be well paid also, needs to be supported. But it's difficult to communicate that to the outside world. That's a challenge. If we don't do, we will be confronted with more pushback by the people, and maybe rightly so. Thank you. Uh, I had other questions, but I think I, I would like to open a bit to, to the audience. So first of all, I would like, if possible, who is thinking about asking a question, if you could raise your hands? <laughs> well, we already have a few people. Um, so the rules for this final part are the following. You have one minute to ask your question or make your comments. After that, I mean, some, somebody will cut your microphone. And then the panel will make a, a huge effort and make very short replies. I'd like to have two rounds of questions. That means that we'll have maximum of two, three minutes each to, to reply. So, uh, OK. Is there a flying microphone? Yes. The gentleman here. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Martin Quack from Diakonie Katastrophenhilfe, a German church agency. And I have a question uh, concerning the, um, the principles, uh, probably mainly to uh, Yves Dacor, uh, because uh, we have this dilemma that on the one side we have the access problem and uh, the problem of integrated missions uh, and um, because humanitarian aid is not neutral enough, maybe. On the other side, you said you'd rather drop these commitments to neutrality and, uh, uh, and uh, impartiality not for ICRC, of course, but for others then continue with a hollow mantra. Uh, that's what I understood. So, but it, it doesn't really fit together. It, also, if we look at what we expect from states, from governments, in Europe we have the, the, the European consensus where we have all the four principles, for example, and, and good, humanitarian, good humanitarian donorship as well. So, I mean, how can we continue to lobby for states and governments to, to, to try to follow those principles, although it's very difficult if we say, well, okay, we, we in our landscape, uh, we, we don't do it ourselves, so we'd rather differentiate much, much more. Thank you. Um, the gentleman there. Hey, I'm Hendrik, a med student, and I'm also working for an NGO that is focusing on access, but rather on essential medicines. Um, my question tries to um, focus on three points you mentioned. One was the improvement of dialogue between non-state actors and government. The second one was UN not grasping the, uh, grasping the importance, kind of. And the third one was the negotiating the access, but maybe on a different level than you were imposing. So there, in the global health world, there's the idea of global health diplomacy trying to implement several measurements and I want, wanted to raise the importance that maybe humanitarian aid diplomacy would also point to improve that kind of um, dialogue and that would be a question towards Pont you Mr. Pontiroli. You were on, on, only asking questions but you, I, I read that you were the representative to the EU so you are kind of the person that tries to um, make a dialogue between non-state actors and, of course, government kind of structures. So um, what you, you think about, like, diplomacy to making it a, um, um, other measures to improve that dialogue kind of. Thank you. Thank you also for the question. The lady in the very back. Thank you. My name is Wilhelmina Welsh, and I work for an NGO in Geneva. Uh, just one question or a comment on this debate. Uh, we have quite a focus on um, how do we approach or measure access of humanitarian actors to affected populations. 
But what I see as a gap in my daily work is how do we address, how do we measure and how do we define uh, situations like Colombia where actually affected populations are confined or prevented from accessing aid that might be available to them. So just a comment, what are your impressions? Are we missing something on that side? Are we actually, do we need to focus more on understanding better what are the situations where the affected populations are prevented or confined or how do we define situations like that where access of the population to our aid is missing? I take a fourth question here, the lady on with, with the orange glasses and the orange shirt. And then we we'll try to answer some of the questions and we'll have a second round. Bear with us. My name is Corinna Keidler. I work for the Norwegian Refugee Council. And Norway likes to see itself as a humanitarian superpower, which uh, comes probably um, because it is not, it, despite all its national wealth, an economic superpower in the world. But I'm also a German citizen. So I would like to go back to the comment that if you made um, on Germany's future role in the humanitarian world. And I'm wondering how you see sort of the ability of Germany being an economic um, and political superpower to play a role in more humanitarian um, diplomacy, uh, given that there is an issue of trade-offs and uh, different uh, agendas. Okay, take one question from there. Uh, yeah, sorry, there was a second microphone, my apologies. And I thank the chair for moving his eyes to the corner of the room. <laughs> um, my name is Sean Healy and I work for MSF UK. Um, most of your, uh, the, the comments have focused principally on obstruction and barriers at what you might say the, which are external in the relations with armed actors or whether non-state or state, let's say political level barriers, but what about the internal or institutional barriers within humanitarian agencies and within humanitarian practice? To give you an example, North Kivu, um, it is possible to negotiate with almost with all of the armed actors in North Kivu, even the most negative of the negative forces. But uh, we, we see that many agencies simply do not do that. Uh, and many agencies find it difficult to get out from under the umbrella of uh, MONUSCO and, and, and uh, 15 kilometers from GOMA. So uh, what, what do you see as the, the principal internal barriers within humanitarian agencies to improving their own capacity to uh, negotiate access with, 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 with armed actors or, or political parties? Thank you. Uh, okay, let's take this last question here and then we do the first round of answers. Otherwise, uh, the three minutes remain even though we have six questions. Uh, hello, my name is Matthias Leibrand. Uh, I've worked 10 years in Yemen. I work for Vision Hope. And I've been in Yemen recently again and met colleagues from all the organizations presented here. And I'm shocked about a couple trends. Trend number one is that many of the international organizations send now African people to be their representatives in Yemen, which do not speak Arabic and which are cultural often not accepted by Arabs in this country. So it's just kind of to reduce their risk of being kidnapped. Second, I'm shocked that they send a lot of young people to the field, to countries like Yemen, Afghanistan, Syria, where we also work. These people are not prepared, they are not intercultural, intelligent, they don't speak Arabic, so there is hardly any preparation along the lines of intercultural intelligence. And the third issue is, um, uh, maybe during this time here, if there could be a session of um, of uh, organizations wanting to work in Syria or are already working in Syria that we could meet informally and discuss this. Again here the point, we work for example in Yemen with 10 local NGOs, we have local NGOs in Syria, but the international NGOs are not really interested even to go this step, they don't trust Arabs, they don't trust the beneficiaries they want to work for, but rather bring in people from Africa, which I like, don't misunderstand me, but uh, and then the reasoning is we cannot work with Arabs because they are not impartial. So I even want to challenge the issue, issue of impartialism because, again, that's a no-go. Thank you. Um, Dennis, you want to start? You've got three minutes. Uh, well, nothing really for me except perhaps <laughs> <laughs> it's for the rest. But Sean's point about internal barriers, I would just say one thing that's probably well known to many of you. I think the 
UN integrated mission process. Peacekeeping with humanitarian human rights integrated into it is a problem. And in one of the conflicts we are negotiating with the rebels on, uh, as you may know, they call the UN the Black UN and the Blue UN. The Black UN is the political part, and the Blue UN is, are the agencies, but not the humanitarian coordinator who's in the mission. He's part of the Black UN. So our debate is, to, our challenge is to try and get him into the dialogue. We can bring in UNICEF, but we can't bring in the UN humanitarian coordinator because he's part of this politicized mission. So I think that's a fundamental issue. It's a huge debate. It's happening again now in Somalia. They're going to integrate the humanitarian coordinator into the political mission, which is highly unpopular. And I think that's a fundamental question. I want to add one more, but it wasn't really asked, but I thought it should have been. <laughs> one minute. UN humanitarian activity, humanitarian action today is big business. When I started decades ago in UNHCR, we'd reached a hundred million dollars budget. We thought it was colossal. Today, UNHCR's budget's about 2.5 billion. Uh, WFP is bigger, ICRC is huge. Uh, the NGOs are, some of them, even bigger than that. It's huge money, big business. And it's also big new donors. The Gulf states and the Saudis are putting in hundreds of millions into humanitarian uh, activities. And it's not subject to the Western devised good donorship principles, which took years to get to agree. So there's a whole new dimension, I would suggest, in terms of the magnitude of the agency's activities and the new donors who are doing their independent thing in uh, Turkey and in Syria and with rebel groups under the, under the cover of humanitarian assistance. Yeah. Uh, I would just like uh, to answer your question. Uh, for me, it's uh, often the question, uh, could Germany do more? Mm -hmm. And what could, could they do more? Uh, and uh, the shortest answer is, look at Norway uh, and do 15 times more, because we are 15 times bigger. This would make a difference. Uh, a bit more uh, sophisticated. Uh, I think among the uh, humanitarian actors, a sort of benchmarking or best practices analysis are rare. Uh, and I think there's a, in some organizations there's a much, a much more professionality, much more skill than in others. Uh, and I would strongly advise not only to compete but also to compare uh, how things are done well. Uh, I would not agree completely to your remark. Uh, I have discovered that there are people who are able to link uh, with the local actors, whether they are white or black, whether they know the language or not, there are people who are able to. And this is a question, and you have, uh, if you have rightly said, this is a question of trust. Trust to be built, it's somehow a long-term effort, it is somehow a, a cultural effort, but we should uh, be aware that this is the main challenge for those who want to go into humanitarian action. And you have sometimes activists who are brilliant and don't know a word of the language, but they're globally accepted among uh, the most difficult actors. And on the other hand, you have people who have studied that and know uh, Arabic uh, by heart. Nevertheless, nobody trusts them. So uh, it is a professionality which needs at the same time a number of qualifications, plus uh, a good heart. And I'll pick up on the question from the back about access of the population to aid. I, I think it's largely a similar situation in that it's about long-term trust building and negotiation with armed groups in order to ensure that the populations themselves are able to access aid as well as the humanitarians being able to enter and provide it. But I think there's another principle that we haven't yet discussed which comes into play here, which is the question of do no harm. And whether access or the delivery of aid is going to put the population at risk, and that of course is particularly present in a case where groups want to prevent the populations accessing that aid. And I think it also relates to uh, the question of conflict sensitivity. 
And here we've all spoken about how humanitarians uh, are increasingly entangled in conflict dynamics and not least in a situation like uh, Colombia with the multiple different dimensions of conflict taking place. Uh, I think there is perhaps a need to be better aware of the impact that organizations are having on those conflict dynamics and then acting in what we describe as a conflict sensitive way to ensure that you're not actually having a negative impact generating conflict um, and increasing conflict risk. So there is a very key dilemma. I mean, I think the question of Palestine comes up again. I mean, by, pass, by uh, subscribing to policies that bypass Hamas, uh, is that actually having such a negative impact on conflict dynamics that it's better not to be engaged at all? Uh, but similarly, in many other situations, that question of conflict sensitivity Whenever impartiality is at risk, I think there, there is a, a question. Um, and then in response to a question that was raised over there about why organizations decide not to go into certain areas, the, here I think we're talking about a number of different aspects of self-limiting behavior on the part of humanitarian actors. And all of that stems from internal risk management policies. Uh, be they explicitly described as risk management or implicit ways of managing risk. And I, not being from the sector, I, I can't comment from personal experience, but it certainly seems that in some cases there's an overly risk-averse approach. And this may be due to fears at, about putting personnel at risk, security risks, and I think certainly there, are, there is too much risk-averse behavior in terms of fear of funding being cut and fear of political implications. And the final point, which is slightly tangential but I think related, is the blurring, the point mentioned by Eve about blurring political and humanitarian agendas. And this may lead to limiting uh, areas of operation, so in, in less obvious ways sometimes. Geographic prioritization, for instance, and the extent to which humanitarians are pulled along with geographical prioritization of their donors means that certain, even particular areas of a country which aren't deemed priority uh, there simply isn't funding in order to work in those areas, as well as countries that are not high on the political agenda. Central African Republic is rising again, so we'll see now increasing humanitarian action and also development action, although whether that's useful is another question. Um, I just would like to touch base on, on I think, a lot, lot I've said on three questions. One, just to come back on, and as you mentioned, Catherine, on the institutional barrier, right, which prevents, in a way, sometimes organizations to, uh, to move into um, places or area where they could do. I really see, I mean, Dennis talked about the political dimensions within the UN organization and difficult. I really see three uh, issues. One is resources. You mentioned, Catherine. I mean, let's be very clear. In a lot of organizations, resources are earmarked. Right? And it makes it very difficult then to go. I mean, MSF, you find a way sometimes because of, because of your strategy of, of fundraising not to have too many uh, earmarked funds, but you are really an exception. Uh, I mean, I see a lot of fundraise and, and fund being earmarked, which makes it sometimes extremely difficult. B, you have a lot of organizations, especially NGOs, over the last five to ten years, they were used to work under the cluster system. Right? Right or wrong, that's not the question. The question is they were used in a way to, give, to be given a frame in terms of fun, in terms of political, in terms of security management, in terms of diplomatic and relationship element. It's difficult to suddenly move outside of that when the frame is there until you go there but not here. It's a very complicated one. We see it in Afghanistan, but rightly so, so it's true in Kivu or all this region. And I think it's a big, it's a big issue for organization, mid-sized organization. Over the last 10 years, they've worked on the cluster, whatever, and suddenly they have maybe to move outside of the cluster or what is allowed or not allowed, it makes it much more difficult. That's one. The second one is risk management. And here, just one point. 
uh, of course, we are in a world where risk management is much more, much more spell out in every organization, including mine, where you want to have scenario, risk audit, control. I mean, that's clear. I mean, this is where we are going, accountability. And that's difficult for us to be able to maintain a decent risk management. The big problem, and I just would like to take one anecdote. 10 years ago, exactly, uh, it was 10 years ago yesterday, uh, ICSE delegation in Iraq was bombed, right? Uh, it was three or four months after the UN headquarters being bombed in Iraq. If you look 10 years later, you see the UN and ICSE. It's different organization, I'm aware of that. But what happened in the UN is, and correct me Denise, if I'm wrong, but the impact on the bombing of the delegation, UN delegation, UN mission in Iraq has made security issues a bigger but also a much more centralized issue within the UN. Now today, uh, in the UN, uh, if you would be one of you head of missions of, uh, of a UN somewhere, you would not be in a position to decide in security terms. It's New York, right? For us, we took the decision, it was a tough decision to do the contrary to allow our delegation on the spot, our people to still decide on security. Of course, check and balance discussion, of course, with Geneva, whatever. But we have decided very clearly that the security, the people who call the shot at the end of the day are truly the people in the field. Of course, structured, we don't want to have a long a shura and discussion about it. It's somebody who is in, in charge of that, needs to make it happen. And it's managed by, in fact, responsible. We don't have security officer all over the place. It's managed by manager in their responsibility to connect with people, but also to be in charge of security. This is fundamental. So risk management over the last 10 years have moved to a much more centralized and organized with expert. It's nice, but it's a very risky one. Because why? Because they are measure, but of course, the, the absence of, of casualties, that's their job to make sure there is no casualties. And that's very problematic, right, in sense. Last but not least in terms, and this is a very important element, it's our own people, our own human capital resource people management. This is the big, big element we have to think in terms of access. And I do think we, we have to change suddenly the, the way we do our human resources policies. That's very clear. Uh, one element is we need to recognize, and I think we know, that the way we are dealing with our locally hired staff need to change. Some of us have done that already, not perfectly, but we need to do that. They are critical to the organization. They represent the organization. Still, some of us measure remote by presence of an expatriate, yes or no. This is completely wrong, right? We need to make sure that within our organization, um, we have a different type of policies. Uh, it's not based on contract, it's based on competences, it's based on situation. B, we will have to play diversity within organization. I don't know how it is for you, but in Syria, for example, uh, my team, if I look at that, 49 nationalities cannot just be deployed. So it's not only competent, but 49 nationalities not allowed to be deployed. So it means also the pressure on us. So it's not just access in terms of political question, but just also deploying the right people, but also the right nationalities. And this is a very a truth. You cannot just say, no, you are ICSC, Red Cross, don't touch, don't even look at nationalities. This time is over. So it means we have to deploy also with the right nationalities. And by the way, Western nationalities, including Swiss nationalities, is more and more difficult to deploy, right? Um, don't, don't worry. I'm Mali, for example, no way these days to deploy for not only French speaking, but of course white people, difficult. Hostage immediately, right? Even if you're ICSE. So, I mean, think about that. How do we do, how do we change our policies within organization? That's, uh, to my sense, one of the top priority. And of course, last but not least, we have to ensure also that our people feel that we're caring for them. So on one hand, we do not want to go for a, you know, armed guard all over the place. It's crazy to go for the blockage, uh, you know, the situation where you put humanitarian in a, you know, completely armed guard. That I think is extremely difficult because you would then so much cut from the people. You want your people to be close to them, but they also need to feel, my people needs to feel that if something happened to them, then the organization will do its out best to get them out. My th I have three colleagues which have been taken hostage uh, 10 days ago in a rebel area. I know that they think, they feel that we will do the best, whatever we can. We are 13,000 people. Each of my people really think about how do we get these people out. We will not forget our rest of the work. We will continue our work in Syria. 
but my team, they are absolutely focused to get our three people out. And they need to feel that. If they, have a, if they would have a, a slight doubt on that one, that would be terribly problematic. So don't underestimate the human resources element, the human capital element, which is a central one. I will be quick. Principle, no, no, okay. Principle, I, I know it's always provocative. My point is not I'm saying other people don't have the right whatever. I'm just saying, and it's great, I'm happy that it's a European you know, commission, whatever, and in the common, I'm happy. But we have to be very careful. We are in a world which is connected, looking at us. If we continue to pretend that all of us, we are you know, kind of humanitarian, and it goes immediately together, neutral, impartial, independent, whatever, and our behavior is different depending organization and depending context, we have a massive gap problem in perception. And I would not allow that. I don't want to be challenged by people who says, you know, this one is not at all neutral, but they still pretend to be neutral, whatever. We have a real problem. I'm happy to have governments who want to finance principled humanitarian. That's great. And it was a great move, really. But then I would like also to be more clear about accountability, and I would find more interesting to unpack. I'm not saying you have the right or not. That's really not our... Uh, already. But we need to be a bit more serious about what impartiality means, for example. Right? And if you are a low partner, if you partner with an organization who is not impartial, that will be much more interesting than challenge. If you hold everybody against principle that most of them cannot do, I mean, then the, this principle are not serious. We have a problem with that. How could you pretend that, in fact, UNHCR, just to mention one example that Denise will please, can be neutral in Afghanistan? I don't know how you can do that. Or oh, in Somalia. I mean, it's crazy. You just put these poor people under situation. They cannot do. They have been integrated into a, this part of all they have, their work. But you can ask them to be impartial. Absolutely. And they can fight within the UN system, say, impartially, whatever. At least we can fight for it. That would be my point. So we need us to, to have a bit of a different rhetoric about it. And I'm not saying you cannot, I'm not saying it's a right or, uh, I mean, you can pretend that. But we need to change the way we're talking about that. Otherwise, I found that very problematic. And last but not least, it's about Germany. Oh, 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 no, 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 oh, I was oh. my point. Ah, okay. No, but Germany. You know, can, can I just say on Germany, and I, I'm, I'm slightly out of this because I know, Germany will be, I think, over the next 10 years, it seems for me uh, uh, even more powerful, powerful, careful. I think the footprint of Germany on the international landscape will be bigger. That's my wrong or right. Now, the question is, you were asking on that one, what I hope Germany will do is, and I think Germany will not change, not in its way to connect with countries like China, Iran, whatever, and I'm sure they will do a lot of discreet diplomacy. And that's welcome, really welcome. And different than the one of Norway, or, or maybe the same, I don't care. But what I find interesting, what I would find interesting is to see Germany, you know, taking the lead together with countries like Norway, but also bringing then Iran and China, for example, on specific issues they could agree. And one issue I really would like to say, where I see Germany together with Iran, for example, just to make an example, and China, not just Germany and Norway, and you know, always the same suspect, it would to see a country pushing at the, all the level to make sure that the notion of healthcare in danger, the fact that today in the world, in most of the conflict situation, but not only, medical facilities, a hospital, are systematically attacked and under pressure, this is something a country like Germany could bring, could push, could also use its tie with strong countries like China, Iran. And it would be a great example that you see the world is not divided on an issue like that. That would be very powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We still have 10 minutes. I'm looking at Ulrike. 10 minutes is fine. Okay, so I, need, I, I, I owe an answer. Uh, to someone about humanitarian diplomacy, but very briefly, the way that MSF is doing humanitarian diplomacy is, and I'm talking as a former MSF, I hope my colleague will, uh, will allow me. I mean, the main objective is in which it's really to, to establish a dialogue with all those people, with all those actors, with, with, with a dialogue was not always the case in in the past. And the basic idea is that we, as humanitarian organizations have team on the ground that see things that are not known necessarily by those people in governments or international institutions to take decisions. And in a way, one of the main objective is basically exchange of information to really be able to, to go in and see the desk of a government or international institution who is responsible for a country which is not necessarily 
on the news every day and tell them, listen, this is the situation our teams see in the field. These are the problems we face in terms of access, etc. Not necessarily to ask them to intervene, but at least to inform a decision-making process. A decision-making process, which is a political decision-making process done by states or international, organiza or international organization, in which as a humanitarian organization, we're not entering into because otherwise we would lose any idea of being neutral vis-a-vis -vis a certain situation, but which we need to inform. I mean, so this is one aspect. Another aspect, of course, is to challenge and criticize through a bilateral dialogue uh, this same organization. I mean, I can talk about the European Union and NATO since these are the two uh, organizations I was dealing with. And, and the idea is to establish a dialogue with them, also to say, you know, you're the EU has been reforming its humanitarian health policy, and to say, listen, our, this is your, I mean, you're doing your own reform, but I mean, we share our opinion with you, and or the EU is talking about the comprehensive approach, um, which would, would, would probably would need an entire other conference, and we can warn them about what we think is dangerous, for instance, is mixing too much humanitarian assistance with political action. And with NATO, it was a bit the same. I mean, of course, with NATO, one of the main challenges is that every time we started a conversation, we had to say, we're not against you, but we're not with you either. And, and one of the main, the most difficult thing for, in our experience anyway, with Western governments and Western uh, armies when we talked to them was the idea of explaining to them that although we are Western, we look Western, I mean, we're trying to de-Westernize as much as possible, we still are based in Paris, uh, uh, Brussels, Berlin, or whatever, uh, that when we talk to them, we say, yes, we, are, we share the same nationality, but that's it. I mean, we really need to take some distance, because the first danger that we have when we engage with armed actors, especially with Western government, etc., is that we think, oh, but we are in Afghanistan, for reason, how many times we heard this sentence? We are in Afghanistan for the same reason, you and I. And we said, no, we're not, actually. We talked to you, and our standard answer so was, we talked to you the same way as we talked to the Taliban's, which was a bit shocking at the beginning, then they got used to it. So this is a bit what, um, what we do. Uh, I think that we have a round, uh, a last round. How many people want to ask questions? I know there was a gentleman here who has been raising the hand and also two and Mark, because so I go with three, I, I will ask you to be extremely brief and limit yourself. So where are the, I don't see the microphone. Yeah, so one is uh, Mark, then we say number, who was number two? We say then the gentleman there and then the gentleman here. And then we see if we have time to respond. <laughs> um, me first. Thank you. Uh, um, oh, sorry. Do you want me to go or no? Okay. <laughs> Mark. Sorry. Um, Mark Dubois from MSF. Uh, Dennis, you spoke earlier a little bit about it being, you know, we're living in a statist world uh, uh, still, and it, it's a bit the old world, and that there are, you know, all the armed groups, and then, of course, Global Fund and important actors like that that aren't state actors, and then multinational corporations, all of that stuff. And you talked about seeing the world through the pers a statist perspective. And I, I really wonder, you know, is it possible? Are we the right people to go beyond that? And, and, and because there's something more than approaching it through an analytical framework that we know that there are these non-state, there's a non-state world out there. I, I really would challenge whether, you know, whether we're capable of seeing the world differently. Uh, because I, I really think that other people would look at the world and wouldn't see a world of organograms. They would see it completely differently the way, you know, the, the way if you put on, uh, I don't know, uh, infrared goggles, you'd see a completely different world. And I... I'm not, I'm not convinced that we are the right people. I think statist people see organizations like us and then join organizations like us or organizations like yours. But that there's a whole different world out there. And the, the best way I can explain it is having been in a Freetown airport a number of times, and at a certain moment, every person in the airport stands up and starts moving. And I have no idea how they knew where to go. And, you know, there's four white people sitting around still looking. Where, where am I supposed to go? There is a completely different world out there and set of signals that I, I, think, we're, I think we're the wrong people. And, and I mean, you know, I don't mean to personalize it, but me and you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, no, no, no. We take it as a comment. Oh, no. I we won't have the time. 
my name is Adrio Bacchetta. I'm, I'm former MSF and now working as a consultant. Um, my point, just going back to the original question that we're dealing with here, obstruction and barriers. From the discussion I've heard so far, the question that comes to my mind is, well, what obstructions, what barriers? And it seems depending on the type of organization that you are, uh, your mission, your history, your culture, uh, whether you're semi-governmental, governmental, non-governmental, non those obstructions and barriers are actually quite different. So we have this landscape, as Eve put it. So there's a massive incoherence across the humanitarian sector that makes this discussion actually extremely confusing. Because sometimes we talk about we, and sometimes we didn't, in the general sense, and sometimes we're talking organization specific. So my question would be, what is it, if we're going to make progress on this issue, what is it, what, what are the key things that this humanitarian landscape has to agree upon, or the things that they should do together, or if they can't get that far, what are the key topics around which they should build their dialogue if we're going to go beyond this very fragmented system that we currently have? So, Ulrika, you have the title for next year's conference. <laughs> There was another, the last question there, and then I, I will allow the panel to reply in one minute, and, and I'll be, and then we'll go to eat, I guess. <laughs> Hi, Ivan from MSF. Just a quick question about a very specific group of vulnerable people. We've talked a lot about people, uh, civilians in conflict zones and so forth. I'm thinking of the migrants, the asylum seekers, the uh, uh, economic migrants, even as they're, as they're sometimes called. Um, and we have trouble accessing them where they have uh, problems, not only in detention centers, for example, in Europe, but on the Mediterranean and in particularly the uh, detention centers that are funded by uh, Western or wealthy countries and that are actually in uh, sort of buffer zone countries. That seems to be a group that's tremendously vulnerable that we don't have, my experience is that we don't have really fantastic success um, meeting their needs or accessing them. And it also feels a little bit like so much of the, the activity to stop their movement or to capture, detain, and deter them or, to, or to, to somewhat be part of the cause of whatever problems they're going through is coming from these wealthy countries where all of our NGOs and where most of, of our organizations are based. It feels like we should have more leverage. Any thoughts? Thank you. This is for 2016 conference, but um, I, I mean, these are two very interesting, one interesting comments and two interesting questions. So I think that we could, we should allow the panel to reply yeah, but I think very, short. very shortly, but really very shortly. So we start with Eve, who will, uh, will be very short. <laughs> yeah, I've, 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 I've been known this morning to being very short, so that's okay. Um, on the two question, I think the, the things we could do as a, as a collective, as a, as a landscape, is to be much more explicit about, it when we talk about obstructions and, up and barrier, what is, what is our problem? Mm -hmm. In terms of where do we have responsibility, we can do something, then organization by organization, right? And where it's outside of our scope of responsibility. It will help a lot already. You know, and it would be different from an organization to the other. But if we could just have a discussion and just agree, what can we do? You know, each of us within our organization or our uh, network and what we cannot do, it will already help a lot, right? Be clear about it. because it's true. We have a tendency to say we, but also we have a very big tendency when we talk about access as put all the problems outside of us, right? There are issues we can, I'm sure, deal, and I think that we could do together. On the migrants, I couldn't agree more about what it means, and maybe that's not really specific for the ICSC. I see two issues uh, for the more Red Cross, National Red Cross, and also some of your organization. I, first of all, I think we have to accept that over the next coming years, um, we are going through a world and, and, and a region, Europe, which should go through a major, is going through a major crisis, social crisis. Absolutely clear, we've seen that. Uh, and I think what we, we are aiming is, is, then how can we shift our responsibility and priority regarding that? I think it's important. Doesn't mean that you don't do what you do outside, but maybe you also take on and engage differently government uh, on the question of, of migrant. And my concern, I have two concerns. One, if I just share that, in terms of detentions, I'm careful not to generalize, but as an experience, ICSC, we've seen among the poorest condition and treatment regarding migrants. Absolutely terrible, including in Europe. They think it's just unbelievable, right? And I think we have a big issue uh, regarding that. And B, 
uh, as I mentioned to you, what I'm extremely nervous about is over the last few years, we've seen massive change in national legislation in Europe, uh, which are absolutely, and it's sometimes linked with counter-terrorism, with terrorism, but it has an impact also on migration. And I think there is a clear issue in terms of the ability for us then to influence, act, operate, uh, and I think I, I quite agree. If there was one subject I would put on for the next uh, United Congress, no, really, it is. It is something to look into much more carefully. And, and typically, ICRC, we don't have a mandate to deal with migration, but we cannot anymore afford. I would say we don't have a mandate. It's not our problems. We see the migration issues, you know, across the board. Uh, in every region, we see that also in detention, as I mentioned before, we see an enormous issues in terms of sexual violence also, which is totally underestimated uh, in country where we touch directly migrants. So I think, yes, we will I totally agree with you. Focus, important. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, I'll try. On the migrants issue, I, I think this is a general question of moving away from a somewhat neo-colonial model whereby we help others and relieve their suffering, and we look at what's happening here in Europe as well. And I think it's a challenge that we also face in peace building and human rights sectors. And it requires a fundamental shift in how we operate, and a number of practical dilemmas come up, not least funding. And I think one of the reasons the focus stays outside sometimes is because it's easier to get funding to do that. And I think this would also help with the neutrality question and being perceived as neutral, but also be looking at and tackling our own problems and our own governments more. Um, I think a second dilemma that comes up, which is a more general one, is, and which is a barrier in itself, is that accountability to public and parliaments actually may continue and increasingly generate barriers to operations um, in the sense that the public and parliament may have problems with the measures taken to increase access. Um, so that may be in terms of shifting to look at what's happening in our own uh, continent, but it also may be if there were greater public awareness of some of the measures taken in order to increase access, um, this would cause problems. I mean, for instance, paying taxes to armed groups. Um, and then the final point, I mean, uh, rather superficially in terms of what can the, the sector do as a whole, um, I'm not sure that that's my place to say, but I think even from the debate we've had today, the issue of trying to understand the multiple levels on which there are access problems I think is key and it relates also to your point that for each organization the access problems are very different and distinguishing between those that are practical on the ground questions and where for instance a strategy of engaging with armed groups or better engaging because of course everybody's doing that but um, would work to questions that are to do with political environment where I think there is perhaps a lot more that can be done on the advocacy side to remove some of those political barriers um, as well as the internal questions. And then finally, I think a deeper debate on the neutrality principle and how that is to be applied in this very different political landscape. For instance, uh, applying the same principles in our own countries, just as one political question, ensuring, accepting that humanitarian assistance is political, but how to ensure that it's not then manipulated by contradictory political agendas, um, that that debate on a contemporary approach to application of neutrality is something that I would say is something the sector as a whole could tackle. Um, and, and then the final set of barriers is, of course, to do with internal organization, and that's an ongoing debate about uh, models, I think. A technical one, but an important one. Are we the wrong people? Uh, we are the ones who are here. So we are the right ones. Uh, if uh, we abide to the principle, do no harm, uh, we shouldn't ask ourselves whether we are the right people. If we can make a positive difference, we should. But this includes that there are areas where we have a responsibility which is particular. And I appreciate very much that you mentioned uh, the question of migrants. The subject of access to the concentrations of migrants hasn't been discussed publicly. It should. 
There are so many stupidities which are discussed uh, in the context of Lampedusa and so on, uh, which have nothing to do with thing, just to discuss something. Uh, this one is a serious one, including how uh, Europe deals with those who made it through the uh, Mediterranean. Uh, there is a field uh, of discussions. Uh, I think also the general debate on principles. There wasn't an outcry in the uh, humanitarian community when uh, the Minister of Interior, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs said generously we will accept 5,000 refugees from Syria. And the Minister of Interior uh, said, and we will select them best they are Christians. This is uh, detrimental even for the Christians in Syria. And the bishops there said so. And I think there we could be a bit more explicit in the public debate, even the organizations who are not engaged very much in politics in Germany. Thank you. Thanks. I will be brief. <laughs> um, one reason you get the boat migrants is because of our failure to protect them in war zones. Let's face it, they may not be classical refugees, but they are certainly coming from conflict-related areas in many cases. So I think the linkage is clear. Uh, Mark's question, well, I don't think we're irrelevant, organization-wise, but I do think, having been in large bureaucracies for most of my life, they're not naturally prone to creative thinking. They do tend to be risk-averse. And I think the challenges, in my view, maybe it's a small, are, are so major now that we need to break the mold. And therefore, I do agree that we need other actors, maybe we haven't even thought about them, uh, around the table. I must say, having moved after decades in the UN to a small NGO, which is discreet and has no red lines really in talking to whoever, is, is a different world. And it certainly, I think, is a, a possibility to be more creative in that sort of environment than in, and let's face it, the big um, politically funded, politically answerable humanitarian agencies, particularly the UN, with politically elected heads. I mean, of course they're not going to uh, disturb the, the political equilibrium that they depend on. So I think it does need uh, some radical voices uh, to come in, informed radical voices, and then go back to states rather than let it be led by those institutions. A minority. You're becoming every day younger. <laughs> thank you. I would like to thank the panel very much because it's been a very interesting debate. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did.